And when you hit submit, another page will come up and then you'll just click on the title <clears throat> about how to increase your success with direct mail. And this is something that I have never seen taught anywhere. Uh, the paradigm in the financial services business is that somebody gives you an already created piece of direct mail or an ad or something like that, and your job is to just use it. But early in my career, I realized there was a huge problem with this, that the pieces I was given were garbage. And, you know, I wish they were a nicer word, but they just didn't work. So I had to then study what makes direct mail work and how do you get people to respond to it because once you know that, it's a tremendous source of business. But unfortunately, what you're given by many financial services firms just isn't that good. And that's because they haven't, whoever they've assigned to make these pieces has not sat down and studied what you'll learn today, which is the science of direct mail. So. Um, I'll tell you when to move to the next slide, uh, which let's do that right now. Hit page down, and let's move to the second slide, which says direct mail, and it says rule number one. So I'm going to just give you some basic rules about what makes direct mail work and what kills direct mail so that from now on you'll have two big advantages. Number one, if somebody gives you a piece of direct mail to use, you'll be able to tell right away whether it's a waste of your money for postage or not. Number two, you could build your own because now you'll know the rules of success in direct mail. Okay, so many times you send direct mail in an envelope. I'm going to also talk about when you don't send it in an envelope. But uh, we first have to cover what I call envelope science. Number one, you have to remove all likenesses to junk mail. If you don't, people will just throw it out. So your mail won't even get read. So the first thing you have to avoid is people tossing out your mail along with all the other junk mail. Well, what are all the likenesses? What makes mail look like junk mail? Several things. First, a non-commercial return address is what you must use. See, if somebody receives a piece of direct mail, and in the upper left-hand corner the return address is Merrill Lynch, they will automatically jump to the conclusion that it must be a solicitation for some investments. And they'll say, but I'm not interested in any investments right now, so they'll throw it out unopened. But maybe it's not a solicitation for investments. It could be something else. So realize that we're in the business of, we're in the psychology business. I know people tell us we're in the financial services business. We're in the psychology business. And what I know about uh, us and our psychology is that we love to prejudge everything. So when we get an envelope, we look at the return address, says Merrill Lynch, we automatically prejudge up solicitation to sell my investments, we throw it in the trash. So interestingly, a big multi-billion dollar company like Merrill Lynch, half of their direct mail gets thrown in the trash unread because they insist of putting their name on the return address. So they got money to figure this out, but for some reason they didn't, and it's pretty darn obvious that this is what happens to their mail. Uh, second thing, better to have a local postmark than a postmark from far away. It just helps the open rate on direct mail. You also don't want to write anything on the outside of the envelope. You know, how many times, think about this, you get an envelope that says, you're free two tickets to Hawaii inside. And you're thinking, yeah, sure, somebody's going to send me to Hawaii for free. This is some kind of sales pitch, and you throw it out. So you never, ever put any messages on the outside of an envelope. That immediately indicates that it's junk mail. You want to send it first class because junk mail is always sent bulk mail. So if you send it first class, it doesn't make it look like junk mail. And if you use a stamp, it's much better than if you have a meter because a stamp looks more personal and is hardly ever used in large volume mailings. So these are all the things that get your envelope not to look like junk mail so at least it gets opened. So just in the last few minutes, I've gone over things that for many people on this call today will double your response rates only because right now 50% of your mail is probably getting thrown out anyway. Just because people look at the return address or you've been using third class postage or you've been putting some kind of message on the envelope, don't do any of that anymore. I'm going to show you in just a couple of minutes what the perfect envelope looks like. 
You should know, by the way, that generally, this is a study that I didn't do, uh, an organization that studies direct mail uh, did this. They found that over a 20-year period, items in envelopes generally get better response rates than self-mailers, like postcards or things like that. And let me tell you why that is. It's because in an envelope, you can say a lot more. Right? You have a full 8.5 by 11 sheet. You could have two, three, four, five of them in there. There's some companies that direct mail 12, 14, 16 page sales letters. It's interesting. You would think people wouldn't read that, but if it's really written well, people get engaged and they do. So that's why things in envelopes do better. There's more, more of a story you can tell than, say, that you could tell on a postcard because you have very little room to give your message. Okay. Page down. So I want to give you some samples here. These are some pieces of direct mail that I got at my house, and let's see what we think. So here's the first one. It came from me from Return Address USA Financial. It's got a message on there, Simulcast Magic Money Show. I don't know. It's got some other stuff on there. Sent with a meter. There's a label. Oh, never, ever use labels, ever. So anybody that ever wants to give you labels, you just tell them, forget it, please keep them. A label is the absolute sign that screams, this is junk mail. Your friends never send you a letter with a label on it, okay? In other words, it's not a personal piece of mail when it's got a label, okay? So this one's got a label on it. It's crooked, okay? This is not a good piece of direct mail, and most of this gets thrown out before it's ever opened. Page down, let's look at another piece. Here's a guy, some congressman, Rush Holt. Remember I told you that people will look at the return address and automatically prejudge the contents. Well, see what you think. If this envelope came in your mail and you see congressman Rush Holt, and down the bottom on the left side it says paid for by the Rush Holt for Congress, you know, uh, tr Todd Sales Treasurer, what do you guess is in the envelope? Because you guessed right as far as you're concerned. It actually doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It's the action you're going to take. You guess, ah, oh, this guy probably wants some money. He wants a contribution. You will say, hmm, I'm not interested in contributing to Rush Holt. You'll throw it in the trash. So this guy is not too clever because most of his mail is getting thrown in the trash. He doesn't even get a chance. He doesn't get a chance to tell you his story because he has placed no focus on the envelope. Now, the funny thing about this is the humorous side of this guy's piece of mail is he, somebody told him, put a first-class stamp on there. Yeah, use a stamp. Helps helps him get opened. Well, doing one thing right but three things wrong aren't going to help you. People are still going to throw this out even though there's a first-class stamp on there. Had he been able to contain his ego and not put his name in the upper left-hand corner, big, you know, bold Congressman Rush Holt, had he been able to contain that, he may have actually got me to open it. Because if it just said, just in small type, just like his address, Rush Holt, I would have thought, Rush Holt, who the heck's that? I wouldn't have known. And maybe I would have opened up. He would have also had to take that Rush Holt for Congress stuff off of the envelope. But then the envelope would have been pretty plain. I may have opened it up. All right, page down to the next one. Here's an envelope from my phone company. Now, obviously... You know, the phone company's going to send you stuff, and right away you know, okay, this is a mass mailing from the phone company. And you might still open it up even though you're thinking, well, I don't know what the heck it is. I know it's some kind of sales pitch, but let me see what they got. However, even my phone company doesn't get this because they, they couldn't contain themselves. They were so excited about this product. They wrote on the outside of the envelope, rest easy with a free month of privacy manager. Now, let's see. I, I guess they think, you know, my IQ is about 12 because here's the way they, I guess they guess I can't figure this out. If it says rest easy with a free month of privacy manager, geez, that must mean after the first month I'm going to have to pay. Well, if they're telling me here's something we want you to pay for and I'm not interested in privacy manager, whatever that is, I'm going to throw this envelope out without even opening it. Think about this. Wouldn't this envelope have been better if they had left that off? Then I would have said, oh, it's something from the phone company. I wonder what it is, and I would have had to open it. But they didn't get me to wonder. They already told me, so I don't have to open it. You see why you don't put messages on the outside of envelopes? It just helps people prejudge the contents and make decisions. They don't have to open it. They'll toss it out, and you've just wasted a lot of money on postage. <clears throat> Page down. This envelope is near perfect. 
Look at the return address. Perfect. Carl Rothblum, a guy's name and his address. You can't get any better than that. It looks totally non-commercial. Not in a million years would you think this guy was soliciting anything from you. In fact, he only did one small thing wrong, which you can hardly see when you're looking at it on the screen, which is the font in my name and address. When you see it up close, there's a little bunch of dots rather than nice laser font, like somebody would actually type at an office or something like that. So it looks like it was commercially made. But so small thing, but he was just shy of 100, batting 100% 100 here. But this is a real, and by the way, this was a commercial mass mailing. It was uh, a solicitation for a contribution to a nonprofit organization is what was in here. But let me ask you this. Do you think Carl's envelope gets opened a lot more than the one that comes to you that says Easter Seals? Yeah, because right away, you see, or American Cancer Society, you look at it, you say, oh, I don't want to make a contribution. You throw it out. At least Carl, he sends me this thing. I'm saying, well, Carl, who's that? I don't know. I open it up, and it's a letter. It says, Dear Mr. Klein. I don't know if you feel the same way as I do about what's really important in life, and he goes into his pitch for his charity. At least he got to open me on open the mail. Brilliant. Only by changing the return address so that I couldn't prejudge it. Simple, simple concept. <clears throat> Page down. People always ask me, Larry, should I handwrite envelopes? No. First of all, you don't do it with a machine because you can tell a machine did this because look how uniform it is. Secondly, you don't need to hand address envelopes if you don't mess it up, meaning if you don't do anything else wrong, everybody's going to open your envelope anyway. See, with Carl Rothblum, his, his, his envelope, it was darn near perfect. So if 100% of the people will open it, you can't get 110% by handwriting the envelope. So the point is, if you do everything right, handwriting does not help you because you can't get past 100% opening rate. <clears throat> Let me show you what a perfect envelope. Oh, by the way, I should mention on this one, there's no return address. You don't want to do that anymore. Prior to October of 2001, before the anthrax thing, I never put return addresses on envelopes. And it worked great, because then people couldn't prejudge, well, who's it from? They would have to open it up. You don't want to do that now because people are now worried about mail that comes and what might be in the envelope. And, you know, we, we're in an age of terrorism and strange things happen. So you want to identify yourself on an envelope so that people feel comfortable that, okay, this isn't from some bad person or they wouldn't be putting their name on there. So don't send mail without a return address in these times. There may be a time again when you can stop using return addresses, but not now. You've got to use it. Okay, page down. <clears throat> this is how the mail that has left my office going to strangers has looked for the last 20 years. And what you see is an envelope. Those are not labels, by the way. They're windows. So you see in one window is a return address, and in one window is the address of the recipient. And there's a first-class stamp. End of story. There's nothing else. So when you look at this, what does this look like to you? Some people tell me, well, I don't know, Larry, it kind of looks like it might be a bill. Or some people say, well, it looks kind of like it's a statement. Okay, or some people say, well, I don't know, it just kind of looks like something official. Well, it, those are all okay answers because I don't really care what people think it is as long as they say, I'm not sure, I better open it up. And then they open it up, and what's in there? Well, there's a seminar invitation, or there's a letter, or there's something that I want to mail, you know, some solicitation. But if I don't get the envelope open, doesn't matter what my solicitation is, the whole thing fails. Okay, so envelope science is where it's at when you're putting something in an envelope, and your envelope should look darn close to something like this, super plain. People can't prejudge it. They have no choice, but they've got to open it, so at least your message gets read. Now, by the way, I'll be happy to answer questions uh, at the end, and here's how I'll do that. You want to email me questions to host, H-O-S-T, at nfcom.com. N like Nancy, F like Frank, com.com, host at nfcom.com. Email me the question, and toward the end we'll have a few minutes. I'll read the questions, and then I'll answer them so everybody can hear the answer. That's how we'll do that. 
Okay, page down. Other things we need to know. Now we got the envelope open, but we're not quite done yet. We got to get the enclosed item read. And there's a few rules to that. If you want people to read what you send them, it has to be emotionally compelling. And I would say, suggest that no matter what you mail to people, you put a headline on it. Now, I know that a business letter, for example, doesn't have a headline. That's what your English teacher taught you. But if you want to make more than your English teacher, you'll put a headline on things. What headlines do is engage people. They see a headline, and it brings them in. So if I'll show you an example of this in just a minute. But if the headline is good, people say, oh, geez, what's this about? You know, what, what's this about? And, and they want to read it. That's what a good headline does. That's why headlines are real big in newspapers, because it's the thing you read, and it makes you want to read the rest of the article. Secondly, you have to have body copy that shows you know them. Let me show you <clears throat> where large organizations don't mess this up and where you can fix this. Large organizations love to speak about things in the third person. In other words, when a large organization sends a letter to Mrs. Smith about buying, say, long-term care insurance, here's the way the letter will read. It'll say, 43% um, of people over age 65 will spend time in a nursing home. <laughs> Clearly, <clears throat> uh, no one wants to be in this group of people. And in order to avoid being ever in this situation, or at least being able to take care of oneself, okay, here's what smart people do to manage their situation. They will speak about everything in third person, them, those, one, can, okay? You'll never do that. You'll always speak to you. So your same letter would say, Dear Mrs. Smith, do you ever get worried about getting sick and not being able to take care of yourself? You have many solutions available to you. And in this letter, I'd like to make sure you understand what all your alternatives are. So it's like you speaking to an individual. That's effective. That third person tone where you speak like it's some uh, PhD thesis paper doesn't work. Nobody responds to it. They don't feel like you're talking to them. So you'll always make sure that you're very personal with people when you're writing a letter. I don't care if you're sending it to a million people. Each person's going to read it, and it's going to feel like you're speaking, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. The formula for a great letter, four things, attention, that's what your headline does, interest, that's what your letter does, the body copy, and then toward the end of the body copy, or the, you, you start building their desire of like something you want them to do. So they start getting engaged, and they start to think, yeah, geez, wow, that is of interest to me. And then the end of your letter is where you have your call to action. So four things. That's all the letter has to do. The offer, the, the call to action, must be non-intimidating. And it's going to actually get more mileage for you if it positions you as an expert. I'm going to show you examples of this. But what you have to remember, and burn this in your brain, your offer must be non-intimidating. Because if your offer is in any way intimidating, people won't take it. All right, <clears throat> so let's page down. I'm going to show you examples in a minute. I just want to set the scene here so you understand these components. Your communication must be about their agenda, not your agenda. So your agenda might be to sell a product or a service. Good, you're not going to talk about that. You're going to talk about what's important to them. In other words, <clears throat> let's say that your business is selling tax-free bonds. You're never going to send a letter about tax-free bonds. What you're going to do is send a letter about how bad tax rates are, and do you pay more than this, and do you, know, do you, do you think you're paying more than you used to, and do you see how this can ruin your retirement, and did you know that there's four ways to reduce your tax bill, and if you're serious and you don't find you're getting most help, much help from your accountant, then send back the enclosed card, and we're going to send you more detailed information on how to cut your taxes. See, that's all about their agenda, isn't it? Because let's assume that it's a person who wants to pay less tax. It's about their agenda. The moment you start saying, cut taxes with our tax-free bonds, 
you now turned it into your agenda, and the thing's going to fail because people don't like to be sold. So your communication, when you're communicating with strangers, at first, to get them to respond to you is always about their agenda. You don't talk about your products. You don't talk about how long you've been in business. You don't talk about how smart you are. None of that stuff. It addresses only things that the prospect is interested in. And what are strangers interested in? I'll tell you. Same thing you're interested in. You'd like to pay less taxes. You'd like to have more income. <clears throat> You'd like to send your kids and your grandkids to great schools. You'd like everybody in your family to be healthy. Okay? <laughs> Everybody's interested in the same stuff. But you can't, you can't say to people, listen, I know you'd like to send your kids to a great school, and that's why you've got to read about my 529 plan. As soon as you do that, you've ruined it. You've got to not bring your product or service into it, or you, you let, you've killed the goose that lays the golden egg, which is direct mail, and most people that use direct mail in this country do kill their chances of making money with it. Okay, page down. The offer has to be non-intimidating. So if you offer somebody a free quote, that's pretty non-intimidating. Like if it's for an insurance product or something else where there's quotes, quotes to get, you offer a free quote. You know, uh, <clears throat> dear Mrs. Smith, uh, lots of people uh, have life insurance policies and would like to pay less. After all, why pay more for something that's, you know, a commodity? If you'd like the lowest rates on, law, on, on uh, life insurance, you'd like to know what they are, <clears throat> fill in this box and we'll send you a free quote, non-intimidating. You know, it, it doesn't say send in this box and we'll call you immediately. Because if you say that, nobody's going to send back the card. Nobody's going to reply. So it has to be non-intimidating. As a matter of fact, how many times have you been watching TV? And, in fact, the insurance companies have figured this out. When they run those little spots to sell some type of insurance, they say, call now for your free video brochure. No salesperson will call. See, they tell you that up front because nobody wants to take an intimidating offer, which is somebody's going to call and try and talk them into something. That's intimidating. So the things you want to offer, free quote, free booklet, free sample. Okay. For years, I'll tell you a little while what I've been doing with free booklets. It's been a gold mine, and I'll, I'll explain you how to do that. But what you don't want to offer, and I see this all the time, free consultation. Financial services people, every Sunday, I can open the newspaper, and in the business section, there'll be some guy, and his picture's in there, and it, it's an attorney, or it's a financial advisor, uh, you know, financial advisor, uh, retirement plans, 401ks, tax reinvestments, uh, da, 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 da. it's got this big laundry list of stuff. Call for a free consultation. Yeah, sure. Mrs. Smith is going to call and say, geez, this guy's a total stranger, but I really need some help with my $3.5 million. I think I'll call him. I don't think so. I think Mrs. Smith is thinking, oh, geez, this guy could be like Jack the Ripper. You know, I don't know who he is. See, we live in a culture where people are scared of strangers. They're certainly not going to call a stranger and go talk to them about their money. So that whole free consultation, not a good offer. What they could offer is a free report about six mistakes to avoid in your retirement years. That they may get some calls on, but they're not going to get a call for a free consultation. Okay, page down. So let me see. Let's see how this letter does. I said a letter, good letter, has to do four things: attention, interest, desire, and action. So here's a letter. <clears throat> it's got a headline. Remember, business letters aren't supposed to have headlines, but that's what your English teacher says. I'm interested in making you a lot more than your English teacher makes. So the headline is: Is your annuity safe? Now, clearly, when you use direct mail, you want to make sure to send it to the right people. The, there's only one right person that should ever receive this letter, somebody who owns an annuity. So we rented a list of annuity owners, and then we sent this letter. Is your annuity safe? You know, and it was mail merged, and it said, you know, dear Mrs. Mr. Johnson, in the early 1990s, two large insurance companies failed, surprising millions of secure, uh, annuity holders. Since then, I'm often asked about the safety of insurance companies. First, and then I go into talking about 
what I know about the safety of insurance companies. I don't tell them, listen, oh, here's where I went to school and I've been doing this 20 years. I don't say any of that stuff because you don't say that. You don't, you're not selling yourself here and you're not selling your products. All I do is tell them, look, your annuity could be at risk. And I tell them, here's the important things to look for, which he won't understand because they're kind of technical things. But at the very bottom of the letter, what do I do? So first I've got his attention. Is your annuity safe? Then I start talking about could he lose some money and why it is that people have ran into problems. So that's the interest. The desire, I say, <clears throat> use these minimum acceptable criteria and this will keep you away from the shaky companies. So he says, well, I want to do that. Yeah, sure, I don't want a shaky company. Then I say, here's the offer. If you would like a free analysis of your annuities, just write in the names below and send me this form. I'll send you a free analysis of the annuity safety. Now, I don't ask him for how much money he's worth. I don't ask him how big these annuities are. All I'm saying is just write in the name of the company and the year you purchased it, and I'll send you back a free report. I don't say I'm going to call him. It's just, wouldn't you like to know about the safety of your annuity company? Non-intimidating offer. And so, you know, I send this letter out, and I get lots of letters back where people write in, you know, uh, <clears throat> MetLife. Your purchase, 1982. Well, you get kind of excited when you see that because you know, okay, well, this thing has no more surrender charges left. I think I'm going to call this guy. But if you get it back and it says, you know, MetLife 2006, you know, okay, well, he just bought it and, you know, you probably may not call. So that's the nice thing about knowing the year is you know who to call first. Very simple idea, very inexpensive. Send it out. I remember the first time we did this, I think we sent it out. It was uh, We split up the list. I think the first week we sent it out, sent out 200 of these. And um, the guy that I was working with, he met with people, $17,000 in commissions he generated from, you know, 200 envelopes. N not too bad. But that's what happens when you send a really good piece of direct mail to a targeted list. Do most people get these kind of results with direct mail? No. Because they're sending direct mail that doesn't work. What are they doing? They're sending envelopes that never get opened that get thrown out. They're sending letters that talk to people in the wrong way rather than talk to them personally. They're making offers that are intimidating. They're not building interest or desire in their pieces. And so the whole thing becomes not very effective. Page down. Other things you want to know to make your mail really effective so it makes you a lot of money. See, it's interesting. We're in a business where <clears throat> I would always tell people to do seminars. I love seminars because I don't know how else you can see 50, 60, 70 new people in one shot. But I know that there's a lot of people who never do seminars because they don't like speaking in front of groups. Well, if you don't like speaking in front of groups, then you better darn have a mechanism and a system like I'm showing you today, a, a, a knowledge, a, an expertise in using other marketing methods. And there's not that many. I mean, you can do seminars. You can use direct mail. You can use advertising. You can cold call. Not a great idea because you got do not call list problems. Plus, it's a waste of your time. You never cold call. That, that's just not good marketing. And, and you've got referrals, you know, like networking, either referrals from your clients or networking. That's about the whole list of how you get clients in our business. You know, it, five, I got five fingers uh, on my hand, and I just covered all, all of them. You got five ways to get business. So if you're not going to do, for example, seminars, and you're not a great network or you just moved to that community because you had to move because your parents got ill or something like that, you darn better have a way to get some business. And this direct mail, once you master it, is a phenomenal way to get in touch with new people and have them contact you. So some other things that make your direct mail effective. Use present tense. From now on, when you proofread a letter that you're sending, I know you usually proofread it for just spelling or grammar things. I want you to proofread for a few more things, that it's in present tense. Don't use the word will. Don't talk about the future. Talk about the present because people will react more to things that have to do with today than they will about the future. Okay, so that's number one. You'll just get a better response. <clears throat> do not sell future benefits. So don't talk about anything that's going to happen later. What's the benefit today? Okay, I didn't, I didn't say to people in my annuity letter, you know, if your annuity company gets shaky in the future, 
you know, or something like that. I said, don't you want to report on their health right now? <clears throat> Use active verbs. So when you proofread your letter, you're going to look for any words that end in ing, and you're going to fix the sentence so that you can get rid of that. Okay? So in other words, you don't want to have a sentence that says, have you been worrying about your annuity safety? You're going to fix that sentence so it reads, do you worry about your annuity safety? Why? Because active words, when you take the ING off, tend to get a better response. There's something about the way they get in the reader's brain that gets them to react more. Page down. Use a targeted list. Anytime you have an idea, a concept, that you think would get a good response, you always want to match it to the right market. So how do you know where to get lists? Well, the starting point, every library, every main library, the branches don't usually have it, have a copy of the SRDS, Direct Marketing List Source. <clears throat> People always ask me, can I get this online? Uh-huh, $600 a year. If you don't want to spend $600 a year, you go down to the library, they got it there for free. And in the direct marketing list source is every list that you can rent. Everybody advertises their list there that you're able to rent. So if you're looking for uh, whatever, uh, Mercedes owners, you're going to find the list there. If you're looking for annuity owners, you're going to find the list in there. Now, what you don't know is who's got a good list and who's got a bad list. That's just a matter of testing. But at least you can find all the lists available for rent, and you never have to you know, guess where to look. Now you know. Page down to the next slide. When to use postcards or when to use self-mailers. Number one, when the message is short. So in other words, if, if you don't get any benefit of saying more, then why not use a small space like a postcard? That's perfectly fine. But if you've got a lot to say, then then you don't want to use a postcard because you want more room. You want something you know that will go in an envelope where you can s say more. So let me give you an example. Uh, oh, well, this ties in with the second thing. I said when the message is constrained for compliance reasons. <clears throat> uh, because the NASD has been tightening up the last, well, year or so, year, six months maybe, on uh, broker dealers and hence representatives, they're now much more strict about what you can say. So two years ago, what they would have said was okay. Nowadays, they say, no, no, you can't say that. So what happens is on a seminar invitation, anything you want to say that would be compelling, they'll say, no, you can't say that. No, you can't say that. If you say that, then you got to tell all this. You know. So unfortunately, if if you're an NASD licensee, when you send out a seminar invitation nowadays. All you can really say pretty much is like the title, when it's going to be, where it's at, and, you know, uh, a little bit about what you'll talk about. Because if you go into it at all, then the NASD would say, oh, well, if you say that, then you got to say this. So, and then there would be all this language that would kind of complicate it. So for NASD licensees, we say, well, geez, just send a postcard when you're inviting people to seminars now because you, you, you could hardly say anything else. But if you weren't constrained, you'd want to send more information. Because if you sent more information, you could make it more, more compelling. You could say, here's six reasons why you will want to attend this presentation. And you could have a whole list. And people would say, oh, geez, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, yeah. Hey, geez, that, that, that kind of really piques my interest. So the more you say, if it's interesting, the more effective it's going to be. But if you don't have much to say or you can't say much, postcards fine. Postcards are also good with existing customers. Okay, so if you have to give a notification of something, or you want all your clients that uh, have the XYZ mutual fund to call you, great. Then you can just send a postcard. They already know you. It's perfectly fine. You can say, dear Mr. Smith, <clears throat> I need to talk to everybody that's got shares in the XYZ mutual fund. Would you call my office this week? Perfect. So postcards or self-mailers, they are appropriate sometimes. Most of the time, you're going to get more bang for the buck out of something in an envelope. <clears throat> Page down. So I'm going to tell you how I've made a lot of money with direct mail and advertising, actually both of them because they're actually close to each other. <clears throat> when I started being a fee-based advisor in 1996, one of the things about being a fee-based advisor that's really good is as your ma money under management grows and if you're getting a 1% fee on those assets, you keep earning more and more. The problem is in the beginning, 
when you're building your business, you need income coming in because you don't have much assets under management. So you need, to you need to have some kind of commission income, something that's coming in right away. <clears throat> so I developed systems to generate that type of business. And uh, what I did was develop a postcard and an inexpensive ad. They both said the same thing. And what they offered was a free booklet. And what I did was I imprinted the free booklets with my picture and my name and my credentials <clears throat> and had my contact information in the back. So here's what would happen. <clears throat> Mr. Smith opens his mail, and there's this plain envelope. He can't tell what's in there. Um, or there was a postcard, actually. I'm sorry. Postcard. And it says, um, actually, the very first booklet I used was about annuities. I, I've used several since. The very first booklet, and it said, uh, Dear Mr. Smith, um, uh, will you pay double taxation? Will you pay double taxes on your annuity? And he starts reading. It says some people overpay taxes on their annuity, and there's no reason to do this. Get your free copy of the booklet, Annuity Owner Mistakes, by calling this number 24 hours, toll-free number, and we'll be happy to send you a copy right away. No reason to lose money when you don't have to. So people would say, well, geez, that looks pretty good, and they they call for the booklet. So after I send the booklet out, I then call them up and say, Hi, Mr. Jones, this is Larry Klein, and three days ago you called my office and ordered a booklet called Annuity Owner Mistakes. Did that get to you? He says, yes, it did. I say, you know, let me ask you something. What was it that motivated you to call for it? And then I go through a script that uncovers what his motivations are, what his concerns are, <clears throat> which he doesn't, may not even know himself, because, see, a lot of times you've called and people have said to you, well, I was just kind of interested. Well, <clears throat> if you don't know how to conduct a call, you're going to get stopped there. But when you know what questions to ask, you can keep going forward and make him even realize why he called. He may not even know why. People never do anything for no reason. Okay? doesn't happen. Human beings always do something for a reason, a reason they might not even know, and when you ask them the proper questions, they begin to realize their own motivations. Once you realize somebody's motivation, then you could say, hmm, you know what? I think I can help you with that motivation. But until you know what motivates them, it's not going to matter. So I had to develop a way to talk to people on the phone that was different than anything I had ever been taught. So go to the next slide. Over the years, I've developed other booklets. So we have four that have the, the booklet, the ad, the direct mail piece, so that people either see the ad or the direct mail piece, and then they call for your booklet. And there's one booklet, an ad, and direct mail piece, they all go together, on helping you avoid IRA distribution mistakes. So that would be a great one if you're looking for people that have large IRA accounts. Or if you're in the business of helping people with fixed income opportunities. I have one called CD Shopper's Guide. It's an ad that they see, and it says, <clears throat> are you looking for higher interest rates than your local banks pay? If you are, call for a copy of the CD Shopper's Guide and learn how you can get higher rates, and we'll also send you a list of the highest bank rates in the country, and I tell you where to get that off the Internet. And you send it out to them, and you follow up three days later, and sure enough, you get appointments, and many of these people are happy to talk to you about things other than CDs. <clears throat> But don't do a bait and switch. You should be a person who can sell them a CD if that's, in fact, what they want. But a lot of these people will buy bonds, they'll buy annuities, they'll buy other things that are safe and pay interest. There's the booklet for annuity owners. Then there's the booklet for people who might be interested in long-term care. It's called Avoiding Mistakes in Buying Long-Term Care Insurance. You see, if you write an ad that says why you should buy long-term care insurance, there's a lot of people who won't read any further. When you try and pitch your agenda, it ain't going to work. You're going to fail as a marketer. And this is, unfortunately, what you've been told to do. But when you pitch their agenda, <clears throat> when you have an ad that says, avoid mistakes when buying long-term care insurance, and when the body copy says, if you've been thought about or heard about long-term care insurance before you buy it, there's some mistakes that you want to make sure and avoid and ways to cut your costs. 
If you'd like to know more about that, get your copy of the free booklet, Avoid Mistakes of Buying Long-Term Care Insurance. Do you see the difference? This ad is not telling them to buy long-term care insurance. It's saying, if you've been thinking about this, if you've been looking into it, hey, you've you got to know these things. You've got to know some things that other people haven't told you. See, that's their agenda. Their agenda is being informed and knowing all the ways to avoid mistakes. Their agenda is not buying long-term care insurance. That's your agenda. <clears throat> as soon as you cross over and get that into your bones and start employing that in your marketing, you start to get very wealthy in this business. And I apologize that you've never been taught this because the companies that have trained you are so product-focused, they can't see that. They're very focused on their product, not on helping you build your business. And it's not that they're bad. They just can't see it from their angle. Okay, let's page down. <clears throat> so, the system that I developed for myself and that we now make available to other financial professionals is a complete package that describes the system step-by-step -step in a 50-page manual. I then coach you weekly so that you have somebody to talk to, to get coaching from, to stay on track, to make sure you implement it properly. comes with 100 booklets that we personalize for you with your photo, your name, your uh, address, everything, you know, so it's personalized. When people receive it, right away, what pops up in their mind? Oh, oh you're, you're, you're the local expert. See, that's another thing, unfortunately. You've been trained to position yourself as a salesperson. The minute you position yourself as a salesperson, people don't want to talk to you. You have to instead position yourself as an expert. So I want you to think this through. Somebody sees an ad or gets a piece of direct mail from you. <clears throat> And it says, get this free booklet, Avoid Mistakes in Buying Long-Term Care Insurance. The booklet then comes three days later. And here, nice colored cover. It's got your photo, your picture on there, you know, your name, your credentials. They flip through it. It's got a little bit about your biography in the back. And they're thinking, wow, this, this person says, looks like they're a local expert in this stuff. And they put it down. They don't even read it. They don't have to read it. Why? Because the phone rings the next day. <clears throat> and it says, hi, Mrs. Smith, this is Larry Klein. Three days ago you ordered a booklet from me called Avoid Mistakes in Buying Long-Term Care Insurance. Did it get to you? In fact, the first time I did this, the woman, Mrs. Anderson, she says, <laughs> here's what she says to me. She says, oh, Mr. Klein. She says, you know, I, I thought some, I assumed somebody would call, but I thought it would be a member of your staff. Now, she didn't know me, but in her mind, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a darn local expert. So you get to choose in life whether you want to keep chasing people because they perceive you as a salesperson, or you get to choose whether they perceive you an ex expert based on how you market to them. So in this system, we show you where to place the ads, <clears throat> where to get the targeted mailing list that matches with your message. We'll even do the mailing for you so you don't have to mess with any of that. So if you want, you can hire us to do that, your choice. Page down, <clears throat> just want to give you some feedback from some of the people who have used this. Carl in Omaha emailed us. He said, I received 38 calls in the first five days after I ran an ad for $89 in a monthly senior publication. The results from the first two ads, so two times $89, he invested a whopping $178, have netted 11 sales ranging from $38,000 to $279,000. I'd recommend the system to anyone who's in the senior market. Page down. Michael in Atlanta emails us, I just want to let you know that I'm having fantastic results with the system. Yesterday I mailed the postcard provided in materials to 4,000 annuity owners in my geographic area. In three hours since the first call, I received 15 calls. See, I know that your direct mail doesn't do this right now. And you're saying, well, how can yours? Real simple. I spent five years studying how to write direct mail. I didn't do what the large insurance companies or broker dealers do, which is hire some kid out of college. You got a degree in marketing? Good. Why don't you go write this stuff for us? And he's clueless. He has no idea how to use the English language to motivate people. But I promise you, the most powerful tool you will ever have to get people to take action is the English language. And that's all we built into our system. Use of English words to get people to contact you and say, can you help me? Page down. Uh, Thomas, Saratoga Springs, Saratoga Springs, New York. Of the 21 prospects, nine scheduled full fact-finding appointments, which resulted in the following. Total life commissions, 11,000. Annuities, nine. Total mutual fund commissions, 3,100. LTC commissions, 1,800. Pending and total commissions of 24,900. 
Oh, he also told us in this little, actually, he was nice enough to write kind of a lengthy letter. He also told us in the letter, he said, all three ads that I wrote to accomplish this total cost him $375. So not bad. This is, this is small, little money to invest to get big, big results because finally these advisors have at their disposal English language which moves people to action rather than language which usually leaves people cold and doesn't get them to call you or respond to you.